Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Today's Top Med Talk is a special edition of At the Top Med Talk Table, recorded at the World Congress of Evidence Based Perioperative Medicine and the World Prehabilitation Congress. This conversation stands very much on its own two feet. Have a listen. My name is John Consulate. I am here from the West Coast of Florida. I am a practicing anesthesiologist. This July 1st was 41 years, me participating in healthcare. I am a regional medical director for HCA, an avid learner, an active researcher, and I'm looking for every new possible way to enhance healthcare of our patients in the United States. And I'll tell you, for years and years and years, I have been a supplier of healthcare, and I have found that to be an honor to take care of people. That's, uh, there's no greater gift that you can be given. Recently in April, I was diagnosed with malignant melanoma. I was scheduled for surgery in May. I had successful surgery May 30th. Yet <clears throat> after being a healthcare provider, I all of a sudden, the physician became the patient. So the experience that I had with the physicians and the care team in Florida allowed me to realize I think I understood, you know, we, we keep going, we keep talking about value-based outcomes in the United States. And with the wonderful experience that I had, I think we have to focus more to stop, listen, and learn from our patients. And instead of value-based care, make the patient the value-based And when we do that, I think we're going to have much better outcomes because when we share value and we get our patients involved, which I am one, I think that's only going to be a much better outcome in the future for all the population in the United States. You know, it, 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 it's, it is, I have learned now the word immortality, the older you get, the two M separate. So you become I mortal. And as you become I mortal, I think you realize about all the things that are incredibly important to you that you have and have not done. For my healthcare journey, I'm absolutely pleased that I have had the opportunity of taking care of some wonderful people. But I think now in the rush every single day of trying getting as much done as we possibly can with patients coming in, not knowing about the value of healthcare, being fearful and scared about what's going on, I think taking a step back and addressing those fears and being compassionate is part of the value that we can add to healthcare. And I think ultimately we'll end up in better participation of our patient population and also significantly better outcomes. Um, The reason that I came on over to this prehabilitation conference, I have been involved the last seven years with enhanced recovery after surgery. HCA actually tasked me to develop some of the first protocols that we had in not just the West Coast of Florida, but across the United States. We're finding great success with enhancing our patients' outcomes, but I am well aware that uh, enhanced recovery and great post-operative care management isn't the whole piece of the puzzle. Um, there needs to be prehabilitation. And watching our my colleagues from the UK, Canada, Spain, the Netherlands, I'm finding out how lacking we are in the preoperative evaluation and the preoperative management of our patients. Um, This is particularly important in COVID during the last two years, uh, 21-22. Many of our patients, particularly our senior population, and the majority of our patients where I work in the West Coast of Florida, our Medicare patients, did not go to see their family practitioners because of fear or concern of COVID. So now they're coming back for their elective surgeries. They're ill-prepared. In fact, they are sicker than some of them have ever been before. So being able to apply the concepts of prehabilitation will make for a much better healthcare journey for my patients. It's very interesting. In the history of anesthesia, some of the best outcomes occur or innovations occur because of war, which of course is a, is a catastrophic and a contrary event in history. If you will, we actually had a catastrophic event, you will, a war against a virus in which we had to develop a lot of innovation. And part of that innovation now is now that we're getting people back into the healthcare system is to really specialize in their healthcare journey. You know, in the United States, I believe we have health insurance. It's really sickness insurance. We would be better off taking taking care of the wellness of our patients than just taking care of the sickness of our patients. 
prehabilitation has been very big in cancer surgery across the world. That seems to be the starting place for everything else. But with the amount of chronicity of disease in the United States, as well as every place else, going into other areas besides cancer, bariatric surgery, the amount of orthopedic and spine surgery due in the United States, oncologic surgery. I think we can really serve our patient population better if we're able to help them help themselves secure a really, really successful healthcare journey. Um, instead of patients coming in and not having any preparation whatsoever, and in my field, anesthesiology, accepting the responsibility of that care, we do the best we can with how the patient presents. But if we can get a healthier patient coming in, then we can do significantly more and guide that pathway through sometimes a very, very large surgery much more successfully. And that's more beneficial for the patient and it's more beneficial for population health because there will be more resources for more people. I think what has happened in my view of healthcare in the United States, and I do have a wide vision having practiced in the Midwest, trained at a, at a Mecca center at the University of Pittsburgh. I have traveled most of the Eastern United States and seen different healthcare systems. I think one of the things that we've done is population health has been left to the Masters of Public Health Administration. I don't think that we have taken population health in medicine as directly as we should. COVID gave us that opportunity to look at population health because we had to look at an entirety of a care pattern because of the illness of the patients and how they presented and how they could affect other patients. So I think if the timing is right for anything in the United States, we have learned through a catastrophic war, if you will, an innovation of the pathway of healthcare. And here's an opportunity to look at prehabilitation, ERAS, and postoperative excellence of management care to get through people quickly without readmissions, without adverse events, and actually creating value in their health care as opposed to just creating value of financial outcomes. You know, the United States is tremendous in terms of acute care. If you have a heart attack or a stroke, we can take care of that. My observation is we have not done a good job in taking care of the wellness of our patient population. We have essentially kind of abandoned that, I think, and we treat symptoms, we don't treat health. In this effort, now that we see some of the accomplishments that some of our colleagues from across the street sees and just north of us have done, I think we need to be more receptive in developing these type of protocols. We certainly have the resources. We certainly have the ability. We have the knowledge. We have multiple companies that will financially and educationally support us. Here is a time with the growing aging population, which I am one, Medicare, the last numbers I saw are 10,000 baby boomers a day going into Medicare. We're really going to have to focus on preservation of health and wellness not just treat sickness. That's the only way that we're going to be able to, if you will, balance budget the health of our American population. In terms of the United States, I think we, again, we have the opportunity, we have the mental acuity, we have the caring of a, a number of different people that I have met in my journey of health. And I think the opportunity more than ever, instead of just working on development of drugs or devices, I think we've hit the epoch of, of what we can accomplish there. So let's look at some of the simpler things that we can do. Reduce smoking, better nutrition, reduce alcohol use, increase mobility. There's such simple things that we can do that perhaps we take for granted. We think people should be doing already, but I think COVID significantly impacted that where people were afraid to go out and walk. They were afraid to go to the grocery store and habits like smoking and alcohol, unfortunately, probably increased during COVID. That being said, we're, see we're seeing a sicker population come to us now. I think more than ever, we need to realize how we can help our patient population improve its wellness so we can really take them through a valued journey in healthcare. You know, uh, in, in looking and we'll just take my European brethren. Um, since many of them have national health care systems, there is, if you will, a responsibility and accountability of getting your health care delivered to you.
In the United States, since we have actually as our system uh, private insurance, that that is becoming a minority of our patients. Um, the majority of patients that we see, particularly in the West Coast of Florida, are government funded, whether they're a Medicare, Medicaid, or military governmental payers. There's not the responsibility or accountability of having to take care of yourself. So that being said, as we have more people seeking health care for more chronic diseases, I think it's obligatory on the American health care system to start putting in processes to help people enhance their wellness. We will never turn away anybody from health care. That's not the way the system is, works in the United States. But if we can help them help themselves. I think that's where that we have to go. That's probably going to be the next big wave of healthcare in the United States. And if it's not, it should be. Now that I have been on the other side, I think that will allow me to actually mature my practice even greater. And I hope that I can be an influence on others before I decide to retire someday. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out edpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.